Hello, I'm Dr. Ian McCullough of Johns Hopkins University. This is a short lecture on social network analysis, clustering, and subgroup analysis. We're going to focus on only two clustering methods. It's important to keep in mind that there are many clustering methods for community detection in networks. Uh, these two that we'll present here are more to illustrate the type of analysis you can do with community detection and subgroup analysis. The learning objectives are to understand the likelihood of random networks actually occurring in the real world, and we'll explain what those mean in a minute. We're going to have you calculate one uh, clustering algorithm by hand, and then the remaining objectives are certain types of analysis you will do with subgroups, block models, hierarchical clustering diagrams, the EI index, and then it's important to understand uh, how social foci that we discussed in previous lecture relate to network community structure. So here's a thought experiment. What would it look like if people made friends completely at random, like flipping a coin? So I've made an adjacency matrix here of an 11 agent network, and I'm going to ask you to pause the video and find a coin and flip the coin. And it doesn't really matter if heads are a one or tails are a one, but I would like you to just sketch this and uh, you know, it's flipping the coin a lot of times, but it's kind of fun. So, uh, so do that, and you're basically randomly creating a adjacency matrix by flipping a coin. So, when you flip a head, you'll put a one in the square. You go to the next square, you flip a coin. If it's a head, you put another one. If it's a tail, you put a zero. So, please pause the video and complete that exercise. I'm assuming you have paused the video, you've completed the exercise, you now have an adjacency matrix that is completely filled out. I want you to look and see are any of the uh, rows the same? So in other words, do any of those rows have the exact same sequence of heads or tails? Now if you do, you got to call me right away because that would be very exciting. I have never in probably close to 40 times of teaching social network analysis and doing this exercise, have I ever found two rows that are exactly the same? Why is that? Well, let's ask ourselves, what's the probability that two rows would be the same? Right? Well, the probability of, of a link existing is one half. So the likelihood that there would be two links, right, uh, that are both, you know, two, uh, L, uh, two elements of the adjacency matrix that, that both have a link would be one half squared. So one half that you had the first link followed by given that condition one half that you have it again right so that becomes the probability. So what is the probability that two agents would have ten links in common right if this was completely random? Well it ends up being 0.01 uh, and that's the problem that we would see in this exercise what happens when you move to an organization of a hundred people which is still not that big right the probability gets very very low so what we see is as the number of agents in the network get larger and larger the likelihood that they have even remotely the same connections is very small but when you actually think about organizations you're embedded in it's very common for people that you work with or people you're friends with to know the same people isn't it and the reason for that is we do not make friends at random and that's the point of this exercise, is there is some motivation for the relationships that we have in a social network. <clears throat> um, so we, we've discussed some of the reasons in social theory as far as why people are going to make relationships and why they are going to remain connected. Um, and the context of what you're using to define a link can also affect this. So if I'm going to have a follower on Twitter, I don't really have to do much to follow that person. Yes, I may need to be aware of them, but it's not like we're having a relationship or we know each other, so it's a fairly low cost. So the ability to have more links is uh, present. But if you're talking about a meaningful relationship of social interaction, conversation, social support, uh, those sorts of, uh, of, of efforts then it is no longer possible to have a large number of friends and therefore the probability uh, becomes scaled by the size of the network and the probability of a link existing becomes even smaller making the likelihood that two people would form random friends even smaller. <clears throat> so because subgroups do not form it by accident 
there is a reason for a cluster to exist in a network. So if you can find the groupings, right, the different communities, you can explore other data, attributes, uh, other qualitative data, to determine the reasons for the groups forming. And that is why subgroup analysis is such an important tool in social network analysis and social media analysis. We need to understand why these clusters form and what is driving that uh, community. So we're going to go with a very common grouping. It's called the Newman grouping. It's actually proposed by Newman and uh, Gravan, uh, but everybody just calls it a Newman grouping. I feel bad for Gravan. Uh, he seems like a nice guy. He should call it the Newman Gravan grouping, but uh, it's more commonly referred to as Newman grouping. So Essentially, the way this works is you're going to identify links with the highest betweenness and iteratively remove them until you have groups. So I'll show you how this works. Let's use this as a network. Well, the first thing is you can transpose a network. Um, I suppose you don't have to do this, but this is just a you know an easy way to visualize it. There are uh, 11 links in this network. So we have letters representing the nodes and numbers representing the links. So you can do a transformation on a network where the links themselves now become nodes and the nodes become links. So if you look over here, you see H is connected to G through link 1 and H is connected to G through link 2. Well, you could just as easily say 2 is a node and it's connected to link 1 through H and it's connected to link 7, 8, 6, and 4 through D. So when we do that transformation, we end up with some labeling like this, where now here's that link uh, line 2, and it's connected to line 1 through H, and it's connected to the other lines we discussed through D. Well, <coughs> this allows me to size the nodes by a betweenness centrality measure. And so now I can kind of look and see, well, what is the highest or most central line in the network? and that was line 2 which then we can remove. We can then say well what's the next largest uh, line in the network and that was line 3 so we've removed that. So now we already have one group over here so line 1 as you recall was connecting nodes G and H so that is the first cluster that we've kind of identified. But we can continue with this process. We have removed line 9. We resize for what's the most central uh, now, I'm going to point out something here. If you look at this, line 7 and line 8 are actually of the same centrality value. So in this algorithm, you sometimes have a tie and then have to make a random choice. In this case, it was line 8. Uh, but that does mean that when you run a Newman grouping and then you run it a second time, you can get different results. Uh, line 7 is then the most uh, central. And then we end up getting to some stopping criteria where we set usually a modularity value, uh, which kind of says uh, ratio of in-group to out-group ties, and we now have three clusters. When we transform this back into the network, right? these are the uh, cluster segments in the network that we have. Okay, And so this allows us to identify three clusters in this uh, network. Now the Newman grouping tends to find cohesive subclusters. Uh, so in other words, clusters that are all connected to each other by the nature of the algorithm. The CONCOR stands for consecutive correlations. This is a different approach to clustering. And what you do with the CONCOR is if you take the rows of the adjacency matrix and you calculate how are they correlated, you get a correlation matrix. So now you still have the agents in the rows and the columns, but instead of having a 1 or 0 for whether a line is present, you now have some number between negative 1 and 1 that says how correlated those two patterns of connections are between the agents. So if you then correlate those rows and correlate those rows and just continue to do that iteratively, you'll eventually converge to a place where there are only positive ones or negative ones in the matrix. And this completely bifurcates the group so that you have one cluster that is all connected or correlated with a one and, and, and correlated at negative one to the others. And you'll have another group that is uh, you know, the same, right? So clustered with each other. So each time you do this process, right? So we, we've bifurcated into two groups. 
then if you do that again, you're bifurcating it into four groups, and if you do that again, you're bifurcating it into eight groups, and then 16, and 32, and 64, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how you calculate a Concord grouping. Now I'm showing you the same network, and you'll see these are colored by their Concord grouping, and you'll see it's different. In the Newman grouping, you may recall that H and G were in a cluster together. And this A, B, C were also in a cluster together, and D, E, F were in a cluster together because it was clustering based on uh, cohesive subgroups or you know who communicates with each other. Here, however, H is clustered with B and A. Why? Well, because they're looking at the correlations in the patterns of communication. So H is connected to D, so is B and A connected to D. That means that they are kind of similar, and so they get grouped together. If you look at E and F, right, E and F are both connected to D, which makes them similar in their patterns of connections. Yes, it's not perfect. E is connected to C, while F is connected to G. But the correlation is looking for what we call structural equivalence. So it's looking for two nodes that seem to interact with the same others, but not necessarily interacting with each other. Uh, this is often used to find nodes that might have similar roles in an organization or similar functions. The bigger point, however, is that there are multiple different uh, clustering algorithms, and each of them is designed or optimized for a different set of principles or criteria. And understanding that is important for doing you know, subgroup analysis and community detection. So we're going to go back to Newman groupings for the remainder of these, uh, extra, of these uh, analytic techniques. The first one is hierarchical clustering. And so this is uh, basically showing you, um, if you recall, there was one group that broke away first. It was the G and H group, right? It was the most dissimilar to the rest of the network. You can kind of see that here if you look at it. Um, so this is saying at what level do these groups kind of break apart? So what we have is the, the nodes in the network are ordered along here. And there's dots here indicating that, okay, they're all kind of in the in the network, and this is at a level where, where none are very similar or none are very tightly coupled. You'll see the X's now in this notation is saying the X for G, the X for H, and X between them is saying G and H are the tightest grouping in the network. So in this grouping, uh, this is like the tightest subgroup. At the next level, Right, it will now remain in all of the other levels of the clustering. So at the next level, A and C, right? A and C are tightly coupled. Okay, and then they say E and F are tightly coupled, and then E, F, and D joins this grouping, right? And then eventually B joins the A, C cluster, right? We see that here, um, and then we have the DEF joins the GH cluster and then everybody's connected here. And so there's a modularity value here for each of them and we typically identify a clustering where the modularity is maximized. And so here we see AC, ABC, DEF, and GH which is the coloring pattern you see in the network. And this is how you would interpret a hierarchical clustering diagram. I think these were more commonly used uh, in in days where network visualization was a little more challenging. Uh, for me, I find it easier to uh, run software that, that colors nodes by a clustering algorithm and then I can visually inspect it a little more easily. The next is a block model. Now the block model is interesting in that it allows you to um, look at the relationship between communities. So the way this works is the, the figure you see to the right here is an adjacency matrix. And what's happened is the, uh, the nodes are ordered based on the subgroup. So I know this still goes A through H, but you'll see that ABC is in one group, DEF is in another group, GH is in another group. So we want to keep that ordering the same. And then we're partitioning the adjacency matrix based on the group. So you see that there's a line drawn here between the ABC group and the rest of the, of the adjacency matrix and same here between DEF and GH. And then those lines are repeated here and here. 
So then there is a set of ones and zeros uh, present in each of the blocks, and that's where the block model comes from. So you can see that you know there's four connections here within group, and there's three connections here that are connecting ABC to the rest of the network or or the cluster DEF, and there's none that connect it to the the GH cluster. So we can then represent the block model as block densities. So we can calculate the density of each block. So in the upper corner here, uh, keep in mind there's nothing defined on the diagonals. So how many possible connections can exist in this 3x3 three three node cluster? Well, it's n times n minus 1, or 6. So you have 4 out of 6 connections that gives us a density of 0.667. Now what's tricky is when you look at the next off-diagonal block, how many connections can exist here? Well it's no longer n times n minus 1 because the diagonals have meaning. A, a node on this diagonal of the block indicates A is connected to D, or B is connected to E, or C is connected to F. So there are actually n squared uh, connections here, or 3 by 3 is 9. So when we see 3, it is 3 divided by 9, or 0.33. Again, if we look here at the uh, middle block, there that has a diagonal, so those uh, are not defined. So there's n times n minus 1, or 6 possible connections, and all 6 are present. So that gets a value of 1. So in this manner, we're able to create densities for each of the group-to-group -group communications. Or so it's a weighted network. There's this concept of an input network density which says the overall density of the network is 0.39. So when you're looking at creating a what's called a reduced graph, I believe we have that on the, uh, we, I did not create a slide for a reduced graph. A reduced graph would be in this case a three node network and you would say how are these nodes connected which a node now represents a cluster of individual nodes. And so there are three approaches to this. One is to say if there's any level of connection, we should treat it as a tie. So that would mean that, that any of these entries here in the density block density matrix right, would, would result in a tie in the uh, reduced graph, uh, except for this 1 to 3 and 3 to 1 connections. Another approach says, no, unless everybody is connected to everybody else, y you don't have a tie. Well, in that case, we would only have these uh, reflexive ties from 2 to 2 and 3 to 3. Another approach is to identify a threshold. And this is a threshold at which you uh, say, hey, above this threshold, we'll consider this a group to group connection. A common rule of thumb is to use the input net density as that rule of thumb. So in this case, we would treat a 1 to 1 reflexive tie, a 2 to 2 reflexive tie, and a 3 to 3 reflexive tie. And we wldn't really consider any other group group-to-group uh, -group connections in a reduced graph. So reduced graphs are interesting because if you make the partitions not cohesive subgroups but suborganizations or uh, particular groups that you think should be communicating in some way, the reduced graph may show you how the organization is functioning and uh, that gives you some insight as to whether it's, it's doing what you want or whether you need to kind of try and increase relationships between two particular subgroups or not. The external internal link analysis I think is the last uh, technique we're going to talk about and so for that same network we have the three different groups and we're going to count how many internal links in, in you know so that's group to group so you know one to one if you recall there were four links in the group one to one and six in the two to two uh, connections so those are the internal link counts connections within the group and what is the external link count, connections outside the group? And then that ratio is allows you to say what percent of internal looking are you doing, right? So what percentage of, of ties are internally facing? So there's a total of 10 for group 1 here, 4 internal, 6 external. So the percent of internal ties is 40%. So you can look at this percentage of internal uh, leaning. And then there's also a silo index, which basically just scales that from negative 1 to 1, and it gives you kind of a comparable benchmark.
to uh, look at across the organization. And we call it the silo index because at a perfect one it means all of the links are within the subgroup and there's no external ties. And so that's a perfectly siloed group that's there. Now siloed groups are not necessarily a bad thing. They're good if you're trying to protect uh, you know, compartmented uh, information that you don't want to leak out if, you know, for a highly sensitive like R&D intellectual property type case. Uh, they're also uh, sometimes effective in for efficient organizations where you don't want a lot of distractions. You're not looking for social capital. You're not looking for, for expanding new ideas. You want to try and protect them from external distractions and uh, and conversations, etc. In those cases, siloing can be a good thing. If you're trying to create innovation, if you're trying to create uh, new ideas, you're, you're operating in a pioneering market, well then that's a very bad thing to be siloed and you want to try and, and have a, a high negative silo index for that. Uh, and this is a tool that allows you to kind of evaluate that in the organization. For social media analysis it's useful because a highly siloed index on a group or a cluster indicates uh, the greater likelihood for an echo chamber to bounce ideas around and and to kind of uh, create an influence effect within that group. Uh, that can sometimes be effective if you're trying to, you know, from like the Greenpeace perspective, you're trying to raise a social media buzz to then use as a way to threaten an organization to take action because, hey, look at this buzz I've created in social media. If you're actually trying to diffuse ideas or information across the network more broadly, uh, then you need to look for organizations that have a negative silo index uh, because they're going to be more likely to propagate information and uh, ideas. Once you've done the work of identifying subgroups um, and, and maybe even looking at a uh, reduced graph from uh, uh, you know using the block model to block density to reduce graph, um, you can begin to look for potential reasons for grouping. So you can say does a particular attribute predict uh, membership in a group. Now, is there something qualitatively I can say about the members of the group? Is um, you know, is there some charismatic leader? Is there some sort of proximity? Are there coworkers that are getting together in some meaningful way? Uh, these are all things that might give you causation for subgroups, and that is important for identifying different cultural context clues that allow you to identify better you know better identify sources of opinion leadership if you want to target the network for any kind of intervention or uh, uh, you know influence uh, activity this has been a short lecture on social network analysis clustering and subgroup analysis i'm dr ian mccullough of johns hopkins university